Hey guys, it's Paul Sullivan again from Digital Bias, and I am here with another great speaker talking all things product-led growth. Um, I hate introducing my speakers. I believe they do it much better than me. So please, Sandy, take the stage. Tell me about yourself. Tell us who you are, what you do, and where you do it. All right. Uh, thanks for having me on, Paul. I'm super excited to be here to talk product-led growth. Um, so I'm Sandy Mangad. I just very, very, very recently joined as the head of marketing at Focus. Um, we're building the ultimate platform for what we call product-led sales. Um, so helping product-led growth companies convert those amazing self-serve users that they have into high-value customers. So you can turn you know, that gold mine of product data into revenue. Um, prior to Pocus, I led growth and marketing for Charlie AI um, and have worked in startups for probably the better part of the last decade, um, ranging from various roles in product marketing, growth and marketing. Um, the main thing is I've always been really passionate about digging into the products that I work on. So I think that's what like really set me apart as a marketer um, is I took the time to learn like what a SQL database was and that mm -hmm. kind of you know, help me learn more about what it means to be a great product and eventually get into product-led growth. Um, I'm based in Vancouver, BC, which is currently rainy and miserable, um, but otherwise it's a beautiful place to live and, you know, uh, convenient time zone, close to San Francisco, close mm -hmm. to LA, nice. um, but also really like deep in nature, which uh, you have to be into nature if you live in Vancouver. <laughs> Right, that's the best balance, right? You've got like a direct flight down into Tech City and the rest of the time you can just be a little bit more rural and take it all in. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I like. So you touched on being a marketer that got into product-led growth, right? So talk to me about that. Where did it all start with product-led growth and why? Yeah, so I think really where it started to materialize fully was probably at my last role at Charlie. Okay. Um before I joined the team, I was actually an advisor to the company and kind of helping them go through your typical like early stage product marketing stuff. So messaging, positioning, ideating on the go to market. And so I was running workshops with the team. And that's where I kind of started to realize like, you know, the team was going towards more of a traditional like enterprise top down sales model. And based on what I was learning about the product and how we wanted to be positioned and kind of where the company wanted to go, I was like, well, you know, it's, it feels like almost we're doing a bit of consumer and a mm -hmm. bit of, a bit of business. And mm -hmm. I almost wanted to suggest like the tactics I had heard from the best consumer companies and e-commerce companies um, and building a go-to-market around that. And I didn't have the language for it right in that moment, but I think what I was touching on was really product-led growth. Is thinking about you know the the growth of your product and how users find it and activate on your product, um, kind of like embedding that within the product itself instead of putting it outside the product in sales and marketing, yep. um, which consumer companies do really well, e-commerce businesses do really well. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't do a great job explaining it in those like early workshops, but then I went and did some self-education, honestly, like I went and uh, searched kind of like high and low about what are the best companies doing. And I just happened to like think about Slack and some other companies like Calendly. And then this thing called product led growth kind of like popped to the top of the list, like mm -hmm. And then digging into product-led growth, fast forward a few months, I had consumed every piece of content on the internet about product-led growth. Mm -hmm. I did uh, a course by Reforge on growth foundations, mm -hmm. and I um, started really joining all the product-led growth communities. And that's really where I got the language that I needed to go back to the team at Charlie and say, hey, we need to build a self-serve product that's yep. inherently viral. Um, and we need to embed the levers for acquisition and retention in the product. And, you know, that's the only way we're going to be able to scale this type of product. We're not yep. going to be able to do it with like a kind of hard sell, top down selling motion. Okay, cool. That sounds really interesting, right? Because that's like a whole process that you have to go through yourself before you yeah. can even go back to the company and buy in something that I want to talk to in a little bit. But before we get there, um, 
what were the early challenges you faced before you got the buy-in? Um, there were a, a ton. Um, okay. I, would, I would say like, obviously educating myself was like one of the challenges yep. because, um, you know, I, I think the, my, I, my instincts were right, but like, obviously, like I said, I didn't have the, the language to adequately explain exactly how I needed the mm -hmm. company to get behind this. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, what would, what would it all entail? So I had to learn all of that. So that was like hurdle number one. Mm -hmm. And then hurdle number two, and I think this was the main one is the team and I include myself in this, we're all, we were all more attuned to that enterprise traditional top-down sales model. So it was like a mindset that the comfort that we always sought was in familiar things. So, okay. you know, let's hire a sales team. Let's like create a lead list. Like all of those tactics were things that were second nature to all of us. Mm -hmm. And even in building the product, it was very much um, a different way to think about uh, product development and how your roadmap is influenced by a few early customers, as opposed to thinking about kind of, you know, the, the broad appeal of just putting it out there and getting people to self-serve onto it. Um, okay. So I feel so like that was probably the main challenge. Okay, cool. There's something you just mentioned, right? You talk about top down, we talk bottom up, top down, right? And we're talking about traditional sales models, the enterprise sales models. I'm sure like the audience that gets the rip that watch this, they'll be like, well, you know, we just need to sell, right? We just need to sell. Do you feel like retrospectively that um, companies that are considering a pivot to be more product led than sales led should just like tear up like the enterprise sales approach and, and do something completely different? So I, I guess like in all instances, it always depends kind of what okay. your goals are. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it, so not all products are suited, first of all, to I think product led. Okay. So, so it, but if you are considering it, you probably have a good reason to consider moving to product led. And in that case, I, I wouldn't say you want to immediately tear up the enterprise sales playbook. Okay. Um, cool. Sales is actually really important. It's just, you want to pivot how you think about sales in, in the world of product led. Um, and that's actually like a lot of what we do at Pocus is, is think about how do you layer sales on top of a healthy product-led kind of growth flywheel. Mm -hmm. The challenge for a sales-led company is first setting up that self-serve flywheel. So yep. if, you, if you're if you primarily sales-led, you may or may not have a freemium or free trial version of your product that users can self-serve onto. So that's going to be challenge number one. Mm -hmm. And then challenge number two is reorienting your sales team to understand how to leverage that new channel of self-serve users as your, you know, like the leads that you go after. These are your now prioritized accounts that you should go talk to, as opposed to, you know, kind of hitting them up when they're cold, you're now hitting them up once they've had some sort of product experience. Okay, so just staying with sales a minute before um, before we move on. Do you feel then that when, um, when you go in product led and you open up top, you open the product up, do you take on a whole new um, approach to recruitment and go and kind of hire some dem demo experts? Or do you train your sales team to become the demo experts? That's a good question. Um, and I've seen it done both ways. And I think it really depends on like your ability to invest in that existing sales team, because mm -hmm. it is going to require a lot more kind of coaching and um like investment into sales enablement, especially like trying to get them to become more of these product experts. Mm -hmm. The other way I've seen it done is you complement your existing sales team with like product specialists or yep. roles like sales assist. And these are people who are specifically trained on understanding more of like the product space and how users are behaving in the product and can mm -hmm. kind of like help them along the way with adoption and engagement. And mm -hmm. then at a certain point, they kind of have a bit of a handoff to the AE or account manager. Mm -hmm. um, I think in like if you are starting from scratch, you your first role needs to be a product specialist, okay. um, or like as I like to think of it, almost like 
the R and D higher, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're really attuned to experimenting. Um, they're not the assembly line. They they don't have a playbook and they don't have a repeatable process yet. They are discovering mm -hmm. it. So mm -hmm. if you have the luxury of starting from scratch, go with the R and D. If you have the resources um, to invest in your existing reps, then mm -hmm. you can certainly retrain them. Um, but I think the happy medium is, you know, retrain some and then hire in a bunch of product specialists. Okay. And just one last question on this. With everything that you've just said for some of the people that might be listening, is there a difference between what you've just explained and what people are now calling the sales engineer? Yes. So okay. I, I think typical and, you know, I, people can feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of what I've seen for about sales engineers is sales engineering roles are like solutioning mm -hmm. often with customers. Um, mm -hmm. And I've often seen them be um, like very consultative. Um, mm -hmm. And I've mostly seen sales engineers work on products that, you know, require some level of like configuration or customization. Yep. Um, and so the persona that you hire into sales engineers and like, you can certainly kind of like pivot that to suit your needs. But I think like the persona that self selects into sales engineering might be more of that um, tinkerer and somebody who can like, you know, build new types of demos on the fly for okay. bespoking something to a specific customer. Whereas mm -hmm. like the product specialist and sales assist is more similar to like a customer success persona. Okay. Um, they're really like leading with customer empathy and really trying to understand how to get you to value quickly within the confines of that freemium or free trial product that you're using. Okay, thank you. Thanks for clearing that up for us. Um, so tell me about, um, you know, you've got buy-in. How do you start setting and managing expectations? Um, pretty simply, <laughs> do not ever promise that product-led growth is going to be some sort of magic bullet. Um, okay. Like that is the number one thing is I think, and especially like in my, in my experience, um, sometimes when you use these buzzwords like product led growth, mm -hmm. um, leadership can latch onto it and then think of it like this, this magical mythical thing. And then it gets into your, um, kind of like investor, uh, outreach. It gets into your reporting to your board. Like we're doing mm -hmm. this product led growth thing and it's going to be game changing. Mm -hmm. Um, like do not set yourself up for that because product led growth is a, a long game. Mm -hmm. And there will be, you know, those walls that you hit. And so managing expectations is super important. So you need to really state, like, what are we trying to accomplish when we're, we're going from zero to one? Mm -hmm. um, what, are, what are the objectives here? And being very clear about this is what we want to achieve. This is how we're going to measure success. And um, essentially, like, create a one pager and put all of that stuff in writing. Um, and it's fine if you change it, but, you know, consistently go back to that as your guiding light, your North Star, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then, you know, from one to 10, there will be another set of expectations that you need to set. But I think it's, it's a constant process of setting and managing expectations and just making sure that everyone's still aligned on what the, the goals are of the company and mm -hmm. making sure that whatever you're doing from a product led perspective match up to those you know like higher level corporate goals okay cool brilliant brilliant and so talk to us about what some of the benefits are of a transition from sales led to product led honestly one of the ones that really sticks out to me that i've noticed is uh, a culture shift okay. so i think one of the things i noticed in moving from a sales led to a product led is the team became a lot more collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, I think in a, a traditional, more sales-led organization, you can kind of just burrow into your silos and, and kind of bury your head and, and do what you need to do because you are just worried about this narrow slice of the funnel. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in a product-led world, everything is a lot more interdependent. 
And so yeah. the company becomes a lot better at collaboration, a lot better at working cross-functionally. And I think that has like a really net positive impact on your culture. Um, so it becomes like a culture of transparency between teams, a culture of, um, you know, deep collaboration instead of like staunch ownership and drawing battle lines between teams and, um, you know, being like, I own this and <laughs> you cannot have an opinion here. Yeah. Um, so uh, to me, that was one of the biggest benefits. I think uh, kind of more of the benefits that are touted at a like big scale is like allows you to, I think, scale faster in the long run. Um, obviously, like the unit economics of being product led are much better than being sales led. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you can handle the waves of something like a global pandemic a lot better because you don't have boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all those other benefits that I think are, you know, well documented. But I think the thing that I talk to a lot of people about is just what it does for a company culture. And I think it just creates a much better environment. And I, I think uh, culture of product excellence. Yep. Okay, cool. Thanks. That's a really, really good answer. Um, I know that um, for people watching that, that you sent me a deck and um, some of the questions I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about are from the deck without actually using it. And um, one of the things that was really interesting when I was kind of just glazing through it was that you mentioned loops and not funnels. Can you expand on that for me a little bit? Yeah. So this actually like, dovetails perfectly from what I just said. Um, mm -hmm. So in that example, where you're kind of burying your head into the ground, because you have a narrow slice of the funnel, that's mm -hmm. what funnels do. Funnels create these organizational silos, they create metric silos. So in my experience as a marketer, for years, working at more kind of enterprise B2B companies, I was tasked with increasing our MQLs. It was all about marketing qualified leads, like fill mm -hmm. the funnel with marketing qualified leads yep. and then toss them over the fence to sales. And then guess what? Like 98% of those MQLs never turn into any sort of closed business. So it's like, why are we spinning our wheels on all of this stuff? And then it never closes. And the feedback loop between the funnel, like a funnel goes this way. It doesn't kind of like go back up. Yep. So just from a visual standpoint, funnels are a bad way of articulating how good companies run. Um, okay. Everything should be a feedback loop. So just from that perspective, loops are better. Um, but growth loops actually have kind of a, uh, a, a bigger foundation in that they allow you to articulate your product model, your product's growth model, your acquisition model, and I think your overall business model into one mm -hmm. framework where okay. each input into the loop has a compounding effect on growth. So for every one user you bring into your product, you're actually then multiplying them by, you know, they refer friends, they invite friends to their team, they share a dashboard. All of these things have a compounding effect. And now if you go back to my marketing example of thinking in funnels, um, as a marketer, I would never care about what happened to a user once they became activated on the product. But when you yep. think in the loop, marketing has impact across the whole loop because you are responsible for acquiring that user, but then you also need to make sure they stick around. You yep. need to make sure that they're incentivized to share your product in yep. some way. Um, and so you can't just bury your head in the sand. So this kind of like backs up, whether it's in product or marketing, the, the flywheel effectively yeah. is like the best, right? Because the more you can do it, the more speed you pick up and the bigger the growth spurt. So that makes a lot of exactly. sense. Thank you for that. And what steps do you take in that process that are repeatable and scalable? Um, so I think in the early days, honestly, <laughs> a lot of it won't be repeatable and scalable. <laughs> okay, so well, that's good truth, right? Yeah, that's the truth. Um, for example, like when we first started thinking about how we're going to set up our self-serve and onboarding, mm -hmm. um, we did white glove onboarding. We onboarded yeah. every single one of our new users ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. So I probably hosted like 200 just on my own. Our founder was doing it. We we're all doing that kind of really unscalable stuff because yeah. then that allowed us to figure out where are the friction points, 
where are, you know, like the areas users are getting stuck. And then that allowed us to then create a more repeatable and scalable version of onboarding, which was all self-service. Um, so I think like one of the key steps in figuring out how to make things repeatable and scalable is first doing things the unscalable way. Um, so do it the unscalable way first, learn something, and then you kind of operationalize it in a repeatable and scalable way. Because the truth is when you first start doing something, it's never going to be exactly how you need it to be. And it's not, you, 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 there's a lot of learning that needs to happen, a lot of testing, a lot of iterating, and it just isn't worth it to invest all the upfront cost of making it automated and repeatable and scalable if you're just going to change it. So yeah. do it unscalable first, learn what you need to learn, and then move into figuring out how to make everything repeatable and scalable. And that's investment in documenting process. It's uh, aligning, you know, uh, people on your team to kind of own specific swim lanes and then the tooling to help you support that. So investing in a good product led growth tech stack, like, um, you know, self plug, something like Pocus would be included in the ability to make this model repeatable and scalable, but so mm -hmm. would investing in a good data warehouse, um, investing in a, a CRM that's set up properly, all of those things help make it repeatable and scalable. Great answer. And so that kind of really ties in with like your product roadmap, right? As you're moving along, you kind of keep iterating, learning, iterating. And so talking about that in, in, specific, in specific terms to product and product-led growth, what are the differences between, the, no, I'll start that again. What are the differences between building product features and being product-led? Yeah, so this is one that I hear all the time. Um, I've heard so many people say like, I don't understand product-led growth. Isn't, ju isn't that just building a good product? <laughs> um, and to a certain extent, they're not wrong. Product-led growth, I think, is just a bit of a buzzy word right now. Um, mm -hmm. Premium and free trial have been around for a while. Bottoms up has been around for a while. We've just mm -hmm. slapped a bit of a label onto it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think... Uh, there is a, a real need to educate on this difference between just building a good product with good product features versus being truly product led. Because I think you can build a great product that people love that mm -hmm. is really hard to self-serve onboard yourself onto. Um, that is really hard to make sticky within your organization. It becomes shelfware, like you, the CIO, loved the product, and then you rolled it out to your organization and then nobody used it. Um, I think when people, when nobody uses the product, it's almost always because you haven't thought about user psychology, you haven't thought about how to make that product sticky. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you think about the best product-led growth companies, they're not just thinking about um, a widget to solve problem X. They're also thinking about how you make that part of your workflow, how it becomes part of your everyday routine. And I think mm -hmm. those are the things that are uniquely um, associated with product-led growth, that you need to think about acquisition and retention as part of your feature development, mm -hmm. um, kind of like at a high level. And then even more tactically, I would say um, a lot of companies aren't always instrumenting uh, to make their their features um, like data driven, right? So yeah. that's something we had to teach our engineers was, okay, every time we build a new feature, we also need to like build the event in segment. Mm -hmm. And because without the visibility into the data, we don't know how to improve our product um, because we don't have like a customer advisory board of three enterprise customers, we can go and say, hey, do you like X? Um, we need to learn whether people like X and then you know, iterate and test and all that kind of stuff. So I, I think there's definitely a big difference between um, just building features and being product led. And it has a lot to do with being a little more, I think, tapped into users behavior from a like user psych perspective more than anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, I had a conversation today and it's a great answer you just gave me there. And it just dawned on me that someone said to me today, what's the difference between a growth hacker and someone who's like becomes a product led application person? Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, 
I feel like growth hacker has a bit of a connotation of being kind of doing slightly more gray area things to like, you know, get more people onto the product. Okay. I, that's at least my perception of, I think the term mm -hmm. growth hacker, I think it's, it's become a little bit like you're really just trying to exhaust the list of tactics to get more users. And it's, I think a lot fo more focused on acquisition. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think product led growth hackers, yeah. you could say <laughs> are a lot more focused on um, what happens in the product and the, the, like deepening of engagement and retention more than just acquisition. Mm -hmm. that, that's my feeling. I think there's a lot of tactics that are, they go back and forth between the two. Growth hacking certainly came before product led growth. I will say that. Yep. Um, and I think it really grew up in more of that consumer uh, tech era. Yep. And so we're now just taking some of those tactics and applying them to B2B SaaS. Okay. And I think that in a way is also how they're similar, but mm -hmm. maybe the way that we're applying them is just a little different. And one more question in that space, because this finished off the conversation. B2B SaaS, would you, are you better with a product marketing professional or an inbound marketing professional? I think product, well, I'm biased. I'm a product marketer by trade. So uh, yeah. I think product marketing is really critical because you can have the best like acquisition tactics on the planet. Mm -hmm. But if your product is not positioned correctly and you're not messaging to the right buyers, which is, I believe, product marketing's job to define, yeah. um, then you can't, you can't tactic your way out of that. Because yep. you'll just be acquiring the wrong people and they will just churn eventually. If yep. not right away, they will churn eventually. No, I agree. So don't worry, I agree with you. I, <laughs> I, I, I think that um, whilst I've got no nothing against content marketers, inbound marketers, like I, I've been doing it for a while, um, I feel that as a product marketer, it's, it's like a small piece of what we do. It's like, do you know what I mean? It's not, it's like someone's taken a part of what you do as a product marketer and you know become an expert in that as you become yeah. an expert in video marketing or an expert in social media right i think that's kind of what they are is that for that fair yeah yeah exactly i think it's it's a channel um yeah. whereas like product marketing is thinking about how to message across the channels like what is our overall positioning mm -hmm. and kind of like why do we exist and yeah. why why should you care those things are so important to define especially early on i think mm -hmm. early on like uh you should hire a generalist who has a bit of product marketing, a bit of content marketing, mm -hmm. is a bit of a demand gen expert. Mm -hmm. You you need somebody who can kind of cover all three. And then eventually you can then have specialists in each of those. Cool. Thank you for that answer. So um, we've talked about process. We've talked about buying. We've talked about approach. You mentioned earlier culture. And I know we didn't get back there, but I am going to take you back there now. Tell me how product-led changes the culture of a company? Um, I think, so back to what we talked about, like the working cross-functionally, um, mm -hmm. I think that's a huge part of it. One of the ways that that manifests, it uh, manifested at Charlie was our um, growth squad. So we had this squad of people who were from all different departments working together on um you know, everything starting kind of like at acquisition. So growth engineers involved in thinking about marketing acquisition. And mm -hmm. then that same growth engineer was then also helping tackle, you know, building features into the product that would help us better activate or retain users. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with customer success. Normally you would only add customer success kind of like further down the funnel or you know, later down in your growth flywheel, um, yeah. where the user is now activated on your product. And we were actually using customer success to help us inform um, what to do even on like acquisition. So I think that's like a real manifestation of what product led growth can unlock in your mm -hmm. workplace. It's just this, um, I think, super beneficial cross functional collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the other things is like, I had engineers asking me questions 
okay. for the first time about uh, where do our users come from? Like, where do you think our best users come from? And I don't think they would have asked me those questions unless we were a product-led company. And I think that makes them better at building product. Um, but in you know previous roles, it was like marketing gets up and talks at an all hands and like every engineer's eyes is just glaze over. They're like, <laughs> I do not care. Yeah. Um, but now with the context of product-led growth being our primary go-to-market and the way that we're doing things, all of a sudden, everyone kind of had more interest in some of the answering some of these questions, which they normally maybe wouldn't have cared about. Mm -hmm. And I think it makes us all better for it. Um, so me being able to say, hey, our best fit users come from this channel and um, they activate much higher because they upload X number of documents in their first three days. Mm -hmm. And so then an engineer that might spark an idea for them and say, okay, if our best fit users come from this channel and they need to upload this many pieces of documents, mm -hmm. it's likely that they're uploading them from their browser. So how do I like optimize that? Yeah. Um, so now everyone's kind of thinking a little bit more like a growth person yeah. uh, and less like just I'm building this widget. Yeah, so you kind of bring a team together of like experts and slowly as a product marketer, you bring them in to kind of understand that you all affect each other. This isn't a yeah. silo effect. This is a combined effect, right? And then the yeah. compound effects of all those learnings and practices helps the company grow and the platform then develops, right? Totally. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so, you know, you've been through this once before at Charlie. I'm sure that... I shouldn't say I'm sure, right? Because that's being really presumptive. Can I rephrase that question? Did yeah. you find it a challenge to build the right team? Yes. Um, not because, I mean, I, I would say yes for, certain, for specific roles. Okay. For example, yeah. hiring a, an engineer who was very attuned to growth and understanding product-led growth, that was hard. So we wanted, we specifically wanted to hire on to, you know, be part of the growth squad, a growth mm -hmm. engineer um, who really could own like basically the same uh, uh, end to end that I did, which is from acquisition all the way to paying customer mm -hmm. um, and finding engineers who are both, I think entrepreneurial is the yeah. right word. Like entrepreneurial in the sense that they understand like the broader dynamics of the business, not just like what is going on with the product. Mm -hmm. That was a little challenging. Um, I think because if you're entrepreneurial and an engineer, you've probably started your own company. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you're probably not working for somebody, but um, really finding a good growth engineer. We, we spent a lot of time on that role because we wanted a very specific type of person to join the team. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that was a bit of a challenge. Um, so, in so before, of, you, before you move forward, Sandy, for people that are listening, what what were you looking for in in this hire? You know, like people are going to be like, "Well, that sounds great," but if I don't know what a growth engineer looks like, and then I have to go and hire it, I can just put the title down there. What am I looking for? Yeah, so I think assessing their understanding of how products grow was one mm -hmm. of like the key things we were trying to understand. So you don't need to know all the lingo, right? Like you don't need to know what a viral loop is. You don't need to know what a network effect is. Like we weren't mm -hmm. looking for someone who understood jargon, um, but we asked questions like, um, you know, do you use LinkedIn? If yes, like, how do you think LinkedIn grows? Like, what is the growth engine behind LinkedIn? And if they could explain something like that, that gave me a good sense of, okay, this person not only understands that, you know, LinkedIn is a networking platform that connects, you know, you to your professional network, which is like the technical terms, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then they have all of these underlying technical things. They can't, they don't just explain that, but they can also explain the way that LinkedIn grows is that you join LinkedIn and then you invite your like network to connect with you. And then those people invite their network to connect with them. And then you post content and that content gets liked by somebody and it gets shared. And that is all kind of like the, the growth flywheel in action. Mm -hmm. um, so having somebody who can explain that um, 
what, one of the indicators that they could explain it was uh, have, having built their own products. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've uh, built a product like a game or some sort of just like side hustle project that mm -hmm. you were really passionate about, you probably understand that. Um, yeah. And that's actually who we ended up hiring was somebody who had the experience of just in their free time, they built like a, a gaming platform. I think it was um, centered around like FIFA, maybe I can't remember exactly, okay. but um, they had the experience of like, you know, I would go into the forums and figure out what people didn't like. And I would use that and then I would go fix my product. And then I would think about, okay, how do I get more users to invite their friends? Mm -hmm. Like explaining all of that kind of stuff told me that this person would be a good fit. It's, yep. it's getting back to that like R&D type persona, yes. right? Yeah. Like somebody who's familiar with tinkering, experimenting, knows how to ship and iterate really quickly. Okay, cool. And thank you for that. Um, that's, that's really interesting because it, it kind of comes back to um, what I think is like my normal understanding of what a grow team should be. And they're just entrepreneurial, it's entrepreneurial, right? Like, yeah. like that core talent is like you have your skill set, but if you're not entrepreneurial, you can't fit. You're not just going to job at being in a growth team, right? That just doesn't go hand in hand. So, yeah. But some some companies might find that difficult, you know, like especially if you, um, you know, some people come out of a corporate environment and so they're quite rigid in, and they think they're flexible, but actually they're really, really rigid. Yeah. Know, we work with founders, we know this, right? And also some people find that threatening. You know, I, I don't yeah. want someone to come in and kind of be a superstar under me because that could take me out of my position. Um, so, so have you come across that challenge and, and have you solved that? Uh, I've seen it in other companies that mm -hmm. I've, like known um mm -hmm. fortunately for me like that's never been my experience um because of working in startups i think you like everyone is expected to be a little entrepreneurial mm -hmm. um especially a lot of my experience in startups has been at you know series a series b series c companies so still mm -hmm. relatively early where you don't feel like you're kind of like put into a box yet you eventually do um and so i've that's never been my experience but i have seen it and I think um, it's unfortunate, really, mm -hmm. because um, that kind of like energy that the entrepreneurial spirited person brings to your company can't be beat. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are limiting that by kind of you want absolute control and you don't want essentially when you are against it, like you're afraid of being challenged, I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're afraid of being challenged, then maybe you don't have as much confidence in your ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Okay, so um, I've got a couple more questions and then we're going to talk about pokers, right? So firstly, give me your top 10 ideas for getting started with PLG. Yes. So this is, again, from that deck that I had previously mm -hmm. sent Paul. And um it was just kind of like a brain, a bit of a brain dump of here's where I think you should start if you're thinking about product led growth. Mm -hmm. um, so I obviously can't go through all 10 of these right now, yeah. um, but I'm going to talk about a few of them that are my favorites. Brilliant. Um, so if you're more sales led today and you're wanting to get started in PLG, um, there's kind of two areas that you could either focus in. You could either think more about product and trying to make your product more self-service, or you could think maybe um, what are some other things that are more marketing related that I could do to start to make my product inch closer to being self-serve. Mm -hmm. So um, let's start with the first one. So if you're gonna go focus on product, obviously a great place to start is self-serve onboarding. Mm -hmm. So how can you make your onboarding self-serve? Um, so you need to start thinking about where are the friction points? How do you make it super clear to users how to get to that first value moment? Mm -hmm. um, and then you really need to think about documentation, like okay. creating the knowledge base um, at this stage. Uh, you know, mine your Zendesk and, and look at what are the most common questions people are asking or ask your salespeople if sales is currently leading this process or your sales engineers, what are the most common questions people are asking? And then you know, document that. So try and make everything as self-serve as possible. Um, 
And then, you know, if again, if you're thinking about from the product side of things, um, obviously getting a freemium or free trial version of your product would be important. If you're moving from that sales led model, um, oftentimes you don't have that. That's mm -hmm. a huge lift. It's a huge, yep. huge lift. So one way you can kind of accelerate that is there's a couple of tools out there these days. One's called Nevatic. The other one's called um, Reprise. And mm -hmm. they both help you make your product feel, your product demo feel more like a free trial or a freemium. So mm -hmm. it's an interactive demo, makes you really feel like you are the one in the driver's seat when in fact it is just a demo. Um, so you could put that out there before you, you know, because it's going to take you a while to make your product, you know, self-serve enough that you can just put it out there as a freemium or free trial. Um, uh, on more of the marketing side of things, uh, one of my favorites is building a sidecar app. And this is the one that I get super excited about because I just think it's so clever. Mm -hmm. um, and a sidecar app is essentially a way to give users a feeling of your product. So they are getting some sort of touch point with the product before the paywall. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't need to be your actual product. It's a sidecar. It can be adjacent to your product's value. Mm -hmm. um, an example of this is HubSpot. HubSpot does this really well. So HubSpot we know is a marketing automation platform and a CRM, mm -hmm. um, but they also have all of these sidecar apps. They have a email signature generator. They've mm -hmm. got like a keyword scoring tool. They've got all of these tools that their marketing team probably built um, yeah. that are adjacent to their product's value. So the persona who wants their product probably the also could product. use yeah, they could use those things yeah. and they get an experience of the product without actually having to buy the marketing automation platform or the CRM. Yeah. Um, if, you're, if your product is already self-serve and you want ideas on how to take like even more advantage of PLG, I would say the one I want to talk about is focusing on defining PQLs, so product qualified leads and figuring out how to operationalize them for mm -hmm. customer facing teams. So if you've already got that self-service growth flywheel off the ground, um, but you're not necessarily now thinking about how do I expand these users and how do I expand these accounts, thinking about product qualified leads is definitely um, one of my top 10 ideas. Okay, cool. Thank you very much for that. And just to kind of flip that on its head, are there any like myths about PLG that you could debunk? Yeah. So the big one, and we've talked about sales a little bit already, is a lot of people for some reason seem to think that product-led growth means like you need to go fire your sales team, <laughs> um, <laughs> like that they are diametrically opposed. And I think it's because product is in the name, like it's product led growth, not sales led growth. Um, mm -hmm. And so people just automatically think product led is the enemy of sales. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is absolutely not true. And um, that's one I want to shout from the rooftops. Mm -hmm. best, the best PLG companies have sales teams. The only difference is they just set them up differently. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, um, I think part of it is like a lack of education on this. Mm -hmm. um, Again, PLG has become a bit of a buzzword. And I think when things become a little buzzy, like PLG, mm -hmm. the meaning starts to kind of filter differently to different audiences. And I think that whole, you know, PLG equals no sales is driven by a lack of focus on that specific lever in your PLG mm -hmm. playbook. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of education on um, what it means to set up the self-serve growth flywheel. And there's a ton of benchmarks and there's a ton of data, but there's like very little data on being in product led sales, yeah. um, which is actually why uh, we're running a survey via POCUS right now um, okay. to figure out like, what are the best product led companies doing when it comes to sales? Like, how do they structure their teams? How do you compensate your teams? And, you know, like how overall is it different than a traditional sales team? Just because we were seeing that there wasn't any of this data out there and it's creating this, you know, myth that PLG equals no sales. Okay. So we talked about like a whole range of PLG problems and sales versus product seems to be um, like a bone of contention, right? We're going to say that. Yeah. Um, 
I personally feel like the best alignment <laughs> can be marketing and sales, but it could also be products and sales, right? Because ultimately they do the same thing. If the product's good, it markets itself. And if the marketing's yeah. good, you market the product well, right? But um, talk to me about POCUS and how POCUS is going to help solve the sales problem. Yes. So we are on a mission uh, to make it so that your sales team doesn't feel kind of out on an island, which mm -hmm. is what a, I think a lot of sales teams at product-led companies probably do feel like, um, especially if the sales function is relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, what happens is I think a lot of great PLG companies, uh, they scale their self-serve growth flywheel, and then they hit like a certain inflection point where now they feel like they need to get bigger deals. Mm -hmm. And they think that the best way to get bigger deals is to add a sales team. But oftentimes they add the sales team, but they create a bit of a silo. So the sales team is now focused on chasing these bigger deals and self-service is just kind of like going on its merry way. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, there's, they're missing like this gold mine of the self-serve users uh, that could be nurtured and expanded into amazing high value, high lifetime value customers. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the way that sales gets layered, um, sales kind of feels like it's out on an island focusing on these bigger deals and following more of a traditional top-down model. Okay. So our position at Pocus is like that old school sales model does not work with PLG. Like you can't just slap sales on top. It can't be like that because then you create the silos and the stuff that we hate. Okay. Um, and so product led sales is all about being able to leverage that gold mine of your self serve users and turn them into your high lifetime value customers. So POCUS is a product led sales platform that helps you understand those users um, and help sales reps convert them into high value customers by giving them insights into what accounts and users are sales ready, which ones need more nurturing, and not just telling you where they are kind of in, in your um, sales process, but also telling you why they are there. Like, mm -hmm. why do we think that Notion is ready for sales? Um, and then not just telling you that Notion is ready for sales, but then drilling down into all of the details of why you, the sales rep, should go and talk to Notion. Um, and that includes data about your pro like how they're using the product, it includes just general information about the company, like how many people within the company are using the product and how much are they using it. Um, and this is all information that a salesperson wouldn't have normally had. A salesperson mm -hmm. normally lives in their CRM and they're focused on just, you know, kind of working the leads in Salesforce. Um, POCUS unlocks that product data plus the data that's in your CRM and puts it into a single view so mm -hmm. that a sales rep has all of these insights and understanding of which accounts to prioritize. That's a really good answer. And I'm going to tell you why. Just before I came and brought you on, I jumped on with um, Ramley John. At, um, oh, nice. And Ramley was doing, um, his call was how to build a product led tech stack, you know, for yeah. analysis and, and all of that stuff. And the one thing that they come up with was this was an area of problems for people, right? Is yeah. um, I think, I think um, they actually said that they felt that within two to four years, sales reps probably wouldn't be living for SaaS platforms wouldn't be living in their crm they would be living in some sort of other software now that other software could be focus right yeah we're making a big bet that it's going to be focus <laughs> i think it sounds like it's going to be focus but just as a like i'm a hubspot agency right and i heard you say salesforce and i didn't hear hubspot like is focus going to work with hubspot or not salesforce uh is just the thing that comes to mind mainly because i think <laughs> I, there's like a lot of people who hate Salesforce. So when I think of like the big bad <laughs> CRM, I just immediately think like, God, Salesforce makes it uh, so Okay, hard. that's more of a compliment. Than yeah, like that. HubSpot is actually a lot easier to work with, especially I would recommend HubSpot more to PLG companies than I would Salesforce. Perfect. Um, 
Pocus will work with HubSpot for sure. We are CRM agnostic. We'll work mm -hmm. with whatever CRM you have. Um, the main thing is the connection between the CRM and your data warehouse. So wherever the product data lives, we need to be able to bring those two things together into a single view. And I love that you talked to Ramley about this because, uh, you know, he's he was like one of my entryways into PLG. So I always look to his opinion on this stuff. Um, yeah. And yeah, he's spot on that this is like a, a big gap right now. Um, we have a few design partners at Pocus that we speak to regularly about, you know, how we're building the product. And um, a lot of the really good PLG companies have like DIY hacked their way into a product-led sales platform like Pocus. Yeah. But all of them would much rather have something that's going to scale with them. They're, mm -hmm. they're all a little worried about their DIY solutions and how brittle they are and, you know, the likeliness of them kind of falling apart. And yeah. also how many resources those DIY projects suck up. Um, just imagine like how many internal engineering resources you would need to like DIY this solution. Mm -hmm. Those people could be doing something much more valuable with their time instead of kind of building integrations between um, all of these different platforms and trying to you know, make sense of it for sales reps. Listen, I think it's been really, really good having you on today. I've got one question. There was only one question to ask. I'm really sorry about that. But someone wants, John wants to know, what do you say to get buy-in from your leadership team? What do I say? Yeah. Um, Product-led growth is amazing. And if you don't do it, you're, you're going to lose money. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's, it's, um, there's no like one thing you can say. I think it comes with having a very strong like strategy or business case, like however you want to position it. But yep. it's really about here's our company goal, here's our product goal. And then here is how product led growth is going to help us achieve those things mm -hmm. at a, uh, at a, uh, much faster clip and will scale much better in the future. I think you need to be able to articulate that. And if you, you can't make that connection, then you're not going to be able to get buy-in from your, from your leadership team. Um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, and then a way to back it up, why this is the right strategy. Uh, it's partially, you need to rely on what you know about your, your product. Like mm -hmm. our product is well suited to PLG because X, Y, Z. Yep. And then you can also say, like Slack, Calendly, Datadog, like here are all these companies that have done PLG really well. And here are the thing, the dynamics in their product. And this is how they are similar to ours. Like, you know, if you have a, um, a communications based product, it relies on messages back and forth. That mm -hmm. is really similar to Slack. So you can point to Slack was able to scale because they were really hyper-focused on making uh, users' uh, ability to message uh, with their team much better. And they focused on getting as many team members into a workspace in those early days as possible. So okay. we have a similar dynamic, which means we could have crazy PLG growth like Slack. So trying to point to examples of other PLG companies who have done it really well and then trying to like draw the line between them and what you do, mm -hmm. I think it's also a helpful tactic. And, you know, if, if you have skeptics on your leadership team who are like, well, I don't know if this is right for us. I feel more comfortable doing traditional old school top-down sales, um, mm -hmm. using those examples and then showing kind of like the, the valuations of those companies and the revenue numbers, all of that can be useful evidence to, turn around the skeptics that's another brilliant answer and let Matt Sandy I'm definitely gonna kind of follow up offline find out a little bit more about Pocus because I'd like to know a like where you guys are going and then b you know with the companies that I'm working with is this a tool that I could introduce to that and then see where that goes I want to thank Bradley because he's um said that you've shared some great insights so that's brilliant and I've got one more here and someone else. Leanne is saying, thanks for sharing Vaughn Sandy. They've learned a lot this evening. So uh, it's got to be worthwhile taking an hour out of your day. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm Paul Sullivan. I'm the founder of Bias Digital. And we work with SaaS companies to do a lot of what Sandy's doing internally. And we provide that helpful outsource resource. You can find us at www.biasdigital.com. 
And thank you very much for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. And uh, thank you, Leanne Bradley, for those kind words. And um, if you want to follow up with me, um, I am Sandy at Pocus.com. If you want to get a little bit more info about Pocus, uh, we also have a Slack community. Uh, if you're interested in product-led sales and you want to join a community of experts, we're like 200 strong already. Um, so if you go to Pocus.com, you can find out more about joining our community there. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Sandy. Appreciate this. Thanks so much, Paul. Have a great one. You too.